Welcome to your kickoff. We really want to focus on better together. And so your presence here is making such a difference because it's a rebuilding year. We're relaunching. And so we want to uh, inspire hope this morning and hope that you have an opportunity to rebuild your program and connect to uh, some climate actions. All right. So in the room. Uh, from the sustainability team back. I feel like it's been a while since we've been back together. Uh, Chris uh, Metropolis is uh, doing all our technical stuff. Um, Jen is in the room. It's so great to have her back. And of course, I'm Pam Miller. I go by she, hers, and I am happy to be back. Um, you'll notice that on the slide, there are our, our department has expanded. We have an energy team now. And that has been so exciting because uh, when the climate action report comes out the end of this week or beginning of next, you're going to find out that we're doing some fabulous work with the buildings and really making a difference uh, for climate change. I want to acknowledge, though, really important, um, our role in reconciliation. And when uh, celebrating the National Reconciliation Day, I just acknowledging, um, you know, the work that we're doing. Uh, our team is actually participating in some professional development from the First Nations University in uh, Regina um, to learn more about what we can do. But right now, I just want to acknowledge that we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. And we also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. I'm going to share right now a video and I'm hoping, um, <laughs> whoops, there we go. Let me just, I just want to give you a little bit of background. When I was in virtual school, uh, we were doing some land acknowledgements in different ways. This particular land acknowledgement was made by a group of high school people in Peel. Um, my husband teaches there and uh, so he helped the students make this. And it's just a, such a lovely way to start again, uh, deepening our relationships with the Indigenous people um, of the land. When they are when they are To try and understand how special and powerful the Indigenous connection to Mother Earth is, let's have a look at the Honourable Harvest, which is a pledge of mutual exchange and cooperation between humankind and the land. Know the ways of the ones who take care of you, so that you may take care of them. Ask permission before taking. Abide by the answer. Never take the first. Never take the last. Take only what you need. Take only which is given. Harvest in a way that minimizes harm. Use it respectfully. Never waste what you've taken. Share. Give thanks for what you've been given. Give a gift in return for what you have taken. Sustain the ones who sustain you and the earth will last forever. So now what? Land acknowledgements aren't about placing blame. They're about taking responsibility. This is why we have land acknowledgements. Take a moment to pause and acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit Nation, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mandat, and is now home to many other diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. So just to fill you in on what happened last year, um, again, just so exciting that people in such a crazy time were able to do actions. So we had 168 schools signed up with Equal Schools. And as you know, it's with Equal Schools Canada. Of those folks, 143 schools submitted their plan. So not only did you register, but you got in there and decided the actions that you were going to partake in. And then we had 40 um, received a participant um, acknowledgement, uh, nine received bronze certification, 12 silver, 30 gold, and 52 platinum. So a big congratulations for those who embarked on that and really made a difference. And good news, we have seals and plaques coming down the line. Uh, so we'll let you know more about that so that you can broadcast your great works um, and then uh, put that up on your walls. 
So our goals today um, is again around climate education. We are definitely uh, more into the crisis uh, with each passing year. But first we wanna start about and give us self permission to rebuild, to start slowly, to, to again, uh, figure out how we're coping with and, and rebuild our teams. If you've got a strong team already, um, then you'll just enjoy some of the extra tips. We'll also give you time to register or we'll, we'll just sort of walk through the registration process. Last year, we walked you through step by step. And if you're new to Eco Schools Canada, we put that at the end of the morning. So you'll have a time with Chris to do those step by step. If you've already registered and know what you're doing, then that time is your planning time. We'll give you some tools and strategies to relaunch your green bin as one way to take climate action. Um, and that's an important part because IPCC is working on methane now. And of course, we want to give you uh, knowledge and experience. Okay, someone's having audio challenges. Um, let us know if you are, because it could be mine. I'm working from home where the internet isn't great. IPC happens to be the International Panel for Climate Change. So this is what our agenda looks like and we're, we're right on time. Um, so of course, um, we've got important parts of the welcome um, finished and then we'll talk about the how and why the, the, inter the IPCC is asking us to work together and the collective agency that we have. Um, and what that, how that looks differently this year. Um, right after that, we'll have question one in a breakout room. So you have a chance to talk and meet other people. Then we'll give ourselves a break. Then we'll go through the Eco Schools Canada application, again, similar to last year, but we'll go through fairly quickly. And then we wanna give you a real strong actionable item on food waste this year, because it does collect to, uh, connect to methane give you another breakout room, again, an opportunity to connect. And then we'll try and be wrapped up by 11 o'clock, which gives you hopefully time for planning or help with registration or just registering, uh, knowing that your lunches um, are all staggered and all over the place. Okay, so I want to start off with um, a, a real diverse welcome. So the first thing I want you to do is how are you coming into this space? How are you doing? Um, it's been such a crazy year of, of uh, the past couple of years with lack of connections and community. And how are you entering um, this year? You can choose a word, you can choose an emoji, um, uh, you can uh, put a welcome into the chat, you can just take time to reflect on where you're coming from. And while you're doing that, um, I'm going to really expand our welcome. So I'd like to welcome people of all genders. This may include people who identify as women, as men, cis, trans, non-binary, queer, gender queer, or others. I'd also like to welcome people of African descent, people who identify as Black, African, African, North American, African Canadian, Asian descent, Arab descent, European descent. Those that identify as Hispanic, Lat Latinx, people indigenous to this land and people of mixed multiple descents. I'd like to welcome languages spoken here and English, French, but so many more, Spanish, Italian, Arabic, um, Urdu, so many more, uh, Mandarin. Um, I'd like to welcome people of different class backgrounds, working class, middle class, owning class, or you aren't even sure where you fit into the spectrum. I'd like to welcome people who currently struggle with getting access to resources necessary for survival, like healthcare, adequate housing, reliable transportation, childcare, and people who currently have more access to these resources. I'd like to welcome people from the GTA, knowing that you're in Toronto teaching, but that your home may be somewhere else. I'd like to welcome people with disabilities, those that are visible or invisible. 
I'd like to welcome gay, lesbian, bisexual, heterosexual, pansexual, queer, or others for whom none of these labels fit. I'd like to welcome your bodies and the different ways you experience yours. And that might include chronic pain, strength, tension. I'd like to welcome survivors. I'd like to welcome people who identify as activists and people who don't. I'd like to welcome single, married, partner, dating in monogamous or polyamorous relations. I'd like to welcome those who are sexually active and those who aren't. And I'd like to welcome those who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. I don't know if we have people in their 70s and, and forward, but if you are here, welcome. I'd like you, I'd like to welcome your emotions as we see in the chat. People who are calm, overwhelmed, but optimistic, excited and overwhelmed, busy, but good. Open emoji mouth. Exactly. Swamped, but good. I'd like to welcome those who support you to be here. I'd like to welcome your families, genetic families or otherwise. I'd like to welcome people with different faiths, religious traditions, faith practices, private practices that don't belong to a tradition, agnostics, atheists, and seekers. I'd like to welcome those dear to us who have died. I'd like to welcome our elders, those here in the room, in our lives, and those who have passed away. And as you're thinking about where your, where your space is, if there's any other aspects of your identity that you would like to see welcomed, please add them to the chat. And then finally, I'd like to welcome the ancestors who lived on this land where we are now. We welcome the spirits of many nations who called this area home, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples, and other First Nations, Métis and Inuit, who has lived in this area before settlers came. And I'd like to acknowledge them and invite their spirits to this place. Welcome. So that is welcome is called a diversity welcome, and it's honoring the work that we're doing on climate justice. And so I'm really honoring this, want to honor the space that we're in, and thank you again for sharing where you're at and, and how you're doing. And the reason I wanted to do both of those things is because the big idea for this year is better together. Um, there's a quote that's resonating in my head, I believe it's Margaret Wheatley, who says, we are wise together. We need each other. We saw that more than ever from last year. We can't do this out without you. Uh, I can't do this alone is really more a better way of saying it. You can't do it alone. We need each other. We need our students. We need our communities. So the latest uh, IPCC climate report, and Chris, remind me what IPCC stands for? Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it was launched in April of 2022 and is the result of collaboration of 270 scientists from more than 60 different countries. Upon release of the report, politicians and commentators gave the reaction, but none more powerful than the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who said, the report is a code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening and the evidence is irrefutable. Greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning and deforestation are choking our planet and putting billions of people at immediate risk. And just note that our fossil fuel companies this year together made over $1 billion in profit. For the first time ever, the, the IPCC gave prominence to a couple of new things. They acknowledge colonialism. And that's on the slide and how it's exasperated the effects of climate change. And they also acknowledged um, methane. So methane is now at the highest level it's ever been in something like 800,000 years. We are without drastic actions. We are going to pass the threshold 
by 2040 unless we take drastic actions. And we need to not only focus on mitigation, which is reducing our carbon footprints worldwide, but also on adaptation. Think of uh, our, our thoughts go and peace go out to people in Pakistan, Newfoundland, Cape Verde, and, and the, the coast, uh, Florida, all the people that are living that reality today. As you know, it's not only a climate in crisis, it's an unequal crisis. And it's deeply intertwined with global patterns of inequity. The most vulnerable people bear the brunt of climate change impacts, yet contribute the least to crisis. For example, if you notice the graph on the right, a Canadian citizen puts on average as much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as four Chinese citizens or 16 Pakistani citizens. And you'll notice the picture is again, uh, the floodwaters in uh, the province, a province in Pakistan. The climate crisis is also not gender neutral. It's also not race neutral. Women and girls experience the greatest impacts of climate change, which amplifies existing gender equalities and poses unique threats to their livelihoods, health and safety. And we saw that at COVID as they were the caregivers. As the impacts of climate change mount, millions of vulnerable people will face disproportionate challenges in terms of extreme events, health effects, food security, livelihood security, water security, and cultural identities. That's the global picture. Close to home, we're also seeing a crisis of climate at home in terms of our health. Ontario health is already being infected by climate change, hotter summer weather, especially when combined with the urban heat island effect, which is when you have not enough greening and you have too much building reflecting and holding the heat. And it's particularly dangerous for elderly people, children, people who are marginalized, housed or homeless, and those with pre-existing health conditions. And as you notice, absolutely, the slide deck will be shared and all the links will be there for you. But as you notice from the slide, when you have something like extreme heat and you already have a precondition that um, it, it impacts your respiratory and that may be from COVID, it then just adds to it. So it's like a multiplier. Or if you have extreme weather, like they had in Newfoundland and you lose your home and you are already suffering from poverty, it just, again, puts you further into poverty as you use what little available resources you have. And we saw this in BC where 619 people died. And those were the people that had no access to cooling or socially isolated, or they already had existing uh, risks. And so all of these um, are, the Toronto Health is looking at these and finding ways uh, to support people. But we said it's an equal crisis, but it's also an intersecting crisis. And recently I picked up a book uh, from Leah Thomas um, about the intersectional environmentalist. And I love what she says. We can't save the planet without saving people as well. It's not a, an and or, sorry, an either or, it's an and. And in fact, um, we should care about the protection of people as much as we care about the protection of our planet. And Mary Robinson, the former prime minister um, or president of Ireland, says, really, we need to stop um, shifting our diet or we need to shift our dialogue from greenhouse gases to really the civil rights movement and the communities that climate change is impacting the most. And I think the graphic shows it best. The climate crisis is one. The social justice crisis is another. And where we work is at the intersection. And lastly, that brings us to our students. How does this all funnel down uh, to the people we have in front of us? Um, they are a generation in crisis. The Lancet published a report where 10,000 young people were asked for their views on the following statements. 83 agreed that, um, that people have failed to care for the planet. 75 agreed that the future is frightening. 56 agreed that the humanity is doomed. 
and more so take a look at the numbers around their thoughts around government. Another survey done by Plan International found that 98% felt worried about climate change. And then closer to home, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, CAMH, um, found that Ontario student, um, for, found that 50% of Ontario students are depressed about the future because of climate change. So the people in front of us have not only gone through the trauma of the pandemic, maybe through inequalities of race, gender, and, and other social justice issues, but now are suffering from anxiety and depression because of the world that we're in. It's not a pretty picture. So how do we find a path forward? And again, in searching for answers, because I don't have one, often you get mired in it and you're like, well, what do I do? And so I, I resonated with these questions that some of the authors in the book um, also asked. How do we guide students through the movement we're living in, even when we can't answer the questions or sometimes we're confused and we don't know the answers? How can we transform ourselves to be worthy of the profound social transformations we desire and need? How can I become anti-racist and also uh, support an anti-oppression when I still am living in a white supremacist culture um, and, and, and sometimes I have so many blind spots? How can we build within ourselves the thoughtfulness, compassion, and courage to dive into this? When, when I looked up the research of what's happening, I just wanted to bury my head and go into isolation, but yet we need to find a path forward. We need to teach when the world is on fire. And so we are at this stage where again, we're better together. We need each other. And coming from the Norwegian author, psychologist, and economist, he talks about where our power lies. Our power lies from demanding social change together. Individual actions are absolutely important, and we do that, and we honor that. But we need to, again, uh, come in solidarity to make the changes that we have to do. And some of those changes are small step solutions, but they're always in the right direction. We don't wanna make things worse. We're always making things better. And societies change when citizens start to act together with others. And so what does that look like? How do we act together? Well, we are educators and we have the capacity to change minds. And this is the, an incredible gift that we've been given. We get to work with young people who inspire and who are incredible in their own right. But education is a key component and it will help us lead to greater action and commitment towards climate change solutions that do support a just and uh, sustainable future. So I thought of two actions we could do this year or really focus on. One is we need to create those communities of care and belonging. We need to start there. And two, we need to empower the students in front of us and give them that power of being that active social citizen to create that fair world by doing two things, working in the realm of social justice and working in the, in the realm of climate justice, working in that intersection. So why is it important to rebuild communities? Well, I think the people in the room um, will know <laughs> how important it is. You may have, um, again, been on virtual. You may have been in and out of schools. You may have been cohorted and you saw the impacts. And if you're teaching now, you saw, you see the impacts of our students who don't quite know how to navigate this social space. We do know that community is critical to student health and their well-being. And if community is strong and they're supported, they're able to face new challenges and they're able to engage in new learning. And that loss of interactions has had both negative impact about our relationships among each other as staff, student to student interaction, but also student to staff interaction. So we need to provide our students with a school community that offer them safety, belonging, joy, and hope before we get to any important work. No use 
changing the planet when you don't know how to live together. So how can we rebuild? How can we rebuild communities? Again, looking at the articles, people said it's great, but it's hard work and it's intentional work. And I just put a few notes up there um, from the research that the things that you already know, welcoming your students, creating safe spaces, focus on relationships, and then provide opportunities for agency, decision-making and problem solving. So as you're working with your eco team, if you spend more of your time with icebreakers and games and fun, then that is exactly what it looks like, building that relationship. Um, I put facing ourselves as, the, as a, an example. They have great resources that include years, like a whole year of icebreakers and things you can do. It's under this um, advisory curriculum, but when I looked at it, it's like how to start a meeting, how to get students talking. And and I just love that. So um, we'll be sharing more resources as you come up with uh, as throughout the year. But if you have other resources, feel free to share back with us. And this quote I learned from a recent um, conference I went to, we must go slow to go fast because success builds at the speed of trust. We are building relationships and we are building trust. And from there, we can start to do the important work. And of course, building relationships includes all our relations. It is not just the people, but it is the land. It is our three brothers and sisters. It's our animal relations. It's all our relations. And so this resource, Lessons from the Earth, actually have Isaac Murdoch giving lessons on how to live with the earth and how to connect from the Indigenous knowledge perspective. And so I love that because it teaches us new ways of coming together, new ways of connecting, new ways to have courage. The role of climate education is really the next piece. So after we've connected in communities, how do we empower students to tackle issues of social justice and climate justice? And the most important thing we need to remember is that we need to make sure that the students in front of us know that climate change is deeply entwined with social justice, racial justice, and environmental issues. They are not separate. So when you're teaching the science and when you're teaching social studies, making sure that you're connecting the dots for our students so that they know. And this is our best hope, that when we include a social justice lens and equity perspective, we can start making real changes in a better society. Right now, unfortunately, our science, our, our climate education falls short. We know that likely that the, the climate curriculum is new in Ontario is through the sciences. And we don't have a lot of resources to teach climate change through other things like the arts, through languages. And those of you who are already doing that, you are amazing. Um, also, we noticed that some of the information youth are getting is through social media because the curriculum requires us to push through. So they're not getting the information they need. So eco clubs, use your Instagram accounts um, if that's appropriate, uh, but use, use things that other ways to communicate because we need that. We also need to recognize that most of us don't go deeply into some of the social impacts. So things like gender impacts, that the, the students who identify as girls in your, in your classrooms are more likely to be impacted by things um, when like severe weather and heat and the, the women in their families. And again, we're doing a really bad job of policies and teaching kids to interact with policies and make decisions both at the classroom level, school level, city level, province level. And of course, age appropriate, how do we empower them to make those decisions that impact our community in positive ways? So in this, this uh, actually this is from this document here, Plan International 
Reimagine Climate Education and Youth Leadership Survey Report. Yep, no worries. So in this report, they also give us some ways forward and ways forward for ministries, school boards, and teachers. And so as a school board, we'll, as a central department, we'll be examining that. But one thing I really want to bring about and looking at the steps that we can take is the real life stories. We want to make sure that we're elevating our students and uh, their stories and allowing them to share their experiences, both their anxieties and being able to uh, their solutions. We need to make sure that we're giving them opportunities to be activists, maybe through eco clubs that you're putting, or maybe through uh, global um, sustainable goal projects. And of course, including Indigenous knowledge and rights is so important in the path to reconciliation. But as we know, traditional knowledge and traditional uh, ways of knowing are actually amazing ways that we can combat the, this climate crisis. And lastly, I want to talk about that when we bring, so if we're, we have built strong communities and now we're empowering students to take action, we need to choose our actions wisely. I, I think about the litter pickup I did with the John English students and think about, you know, one of the things I forgot to do was talk about the causes and the sources. So I my I sort of take the impact and the individual action, but I show them the root cause and the problem so that we also have opportunities to understand how things are connected. So in this slide, I've tried to outline three things that the IPCC report calls for and ways that we might engage our students in actions that will actually make a difference that are, are research-based, again, from 270 scientists that say this is the way to go. And these are actually real examples from youth groups in Guelph, Waterloo, Minnesota. Kids are actually doing this already. So when we teach young people how to engage in policy making, maybe we start with the school policies. What do we do with the food waste from snack programs? How can we work with the snack delivers and the, and the TDSB nutrition department in our school to eliminate and or reduce food waste. And then how do we engage with the most vulnerable group? You may have, as we did, we had a black school, or sorry, black student association. How do we engage with that group of engaged students to talk about how climate is impacting their lives? And how do we empower them to work on climate solutions, even if they're not part of the eco club? They don't need to be. They need to, we need to address social justice issues because they intersect. So for example, one group to help businesses in their community move to renewable energy. And that might be, you know, helping them understand what's needed, helping them access the resources that the Ontario is offering. And then lastly, how do we make space for young people to lead? And I think it's giving space for young people to talk about, to react to local issues, and then they have the experiences, connections, persistence. They don't need to wait for us. So we have some groups doing things um, on their own. We've seen that on the high school level. In the elementary, maybe it's helping leading like a research project. And this group did a research project on cycling infrastructure in their neighborhood and then presented it to council. And I'm reminded of Jackman who did a research project on the plastic clamshells and presented it to Toronto City Council. So these are the strategic actions we wanna focus on this year. How do we make real changes that have a, an impact? Um, again, we don't abandon the, the regular things we're doing because we know that develops agency, but we're really thinking about how to empower our students in this fight. And lastly, I want to leave you with a thought from Colette Pichon Battle. She gave a uh, keynote, or a, I guess the closing keynote, to a conference in San Francisco. If you have a chance, we'll share the link. It's a little bit longer. I've, I've snipped out a little bit of what's important. And she talks about this need for us to work together. 
And um, I hope you find this as inspiring as I do. What we have right now is an opportunity to reconnect with our humanity to each other, to stop thinking in red and blue, to stop thinking in West and South, to stop thinking in male and female, and to come together as humans and say, enough is enough. This is our planet. We love her people and we stand together. You don't get to be comfortable until everybody's comfortable. If some people have to struggle, let's struggle together. But what we cannot do is maintain this system that says you are worth more than me. It is not true. You search your heart. You know I'm telling the truth. We are of equal value, all of us, each of us. And we have to be able to push that, say that, and know that with all of our hearts. We need you to stand with us now. And it's not just about what you tweet, although we could use some good tweets saying stand with the front lines. And it's not just about what you put on your Facebook, although every now and again, it's important to tell folks on the front lines that you see them and you stand with them and you support them. But what we need now, you brilliant thinkers of San Francisco, you tech nerds, you brilliant business folks, what we need now is your imagination. And your imagination has to have enough courage to move past the system that has been told and sold to you is the only way to go. It is not. What we know for sure is that our human endeavors can bring us to much higher levels, and we need that now. We cannot move from one thing that harms to another thing that harms. We cannot move to just business opportunities when people's lives are at stake. We cannot take this moment as a moment we will ever have again. We will not. This is our opportunity. This is our moment to shine. This is our moment to lead. It is not the millions that you can make off of a product. It is not the billions that you can get in a tweet. Where we are right now, friends, we are at the moment that we will never get again. This is the moment where if we choose from San Francisco to Louisiana, if we choose people, if we choose this planet over profits, over capitalism, over making your mark, if we choose together, if we choose community, if we choose collectivism instead of individualism, this is the moment that we will all be proud of forever, forever, because this will be the moment with that we change. This will be the moment that we change this country and what it does to this planet. I hope that you are inspired by that. If you have a chance when we send you the slides that you will be able to watch the full thing. I, I get emotional every time I watch her. She goes much more in depth about the social injustices that need to be addressed with the climate injustices. And I hope that brings again you inspiration to again work collectively. So now we're going to uh, take a moment to really check in and share uh, with each other. Um, at the beginning, I asked you how you're doing and absolutely check in with people when you get into breakout rooms, find out how people are doing. We do have a question for you and for the first uh, breakout room, it'll be 10 minutes long. Again, if your group wants to answer the question, that will prime some great thinking, please do. But if your group would like to spend time on community building, we wanna honor that. So our first question, um, putting the slide up, it has both, but how might you, again, create that inclusive, strong, caring eco team that not only cares for the people, but also cares for the planet? So how are you going to build that strong, caring community for both planet and people? So at this point, I'm gonna pass you over to Chris. We're gonna put you into breakout rooms uh, he'll let us know when he's ready to do that. Again, with breakout rooms, you're invited to join one, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to pop in and listen to one or two. Um, we're going to give you 10 minutes, and then we'll pull you out. And then after that, it, you'll have 10 minutes for a comfort break. All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, Chris is going to take us through the next section. Again, uh, just if you're new to this Eco Schools uh, Canada program. There'll be time at the end of our agenda um, to work with you directly to make sure we can help you register and walk through how to make a plan. Um, if this is 
uh, old school for you now, you've got it under your belt, then, then you get to use the time um, for planning at the end of our session today. But we'll give you the overview because if you're like me, I've already forgotten my name uh, or my password or where to find us. Yeah, you know, you know that feeling, right? You walk into a room and you're like, why am I here? Okay. <laughs> why am I here? <laughs> exactly. All right, Chris, take it away. Okay, so hopefully this will remind me of why I'm here. Uh, so the wonderful ECA, which is, of course, the EcoSchools certification application, and that is their online tool where all of our EcoSchools wonderfulness happens. If you haven't logged in yet this year, no problem. There is no real deadline to actually get registered and started, which is kind of nice and flexible. But of course, uh, the URL, again, is up at the top of the screen there, app.ecoschools.ca. And uh, we'll be including all the links uh, to get to these places. But of course, you've already registered, so you just need to put in your email, probably is the easiest, or if you did create a username and you remember it, uh, you can use that and your password, and you would log in. Those of you that have not done this part yet, you would be clicking on the register button without bothering to put in your email yet. They'll ask for that uh, through the sign up process, and we'll cover that at the end of today. But once you do log in, the dashboard is the first thing that you're going to see. You can create your plan, and if you haven't done that yet, no problem. We'll just very quickly go through that. And of course, you monitor all your progress here. And if you haven't done your plan, you can choose one of the suggested plans, or you can just do a piecemeal on your own kind of uh, decision making. So this is more or less what the dashboard looks like the first time you sign in at the beginning of the year and uh, not quite the right name, uh, but we've got that create plan button over on the right hand side. You'll also see the deadline. It's I believe May 19th for uh, next year would be the deadline. But uh, click that create plan button. And the first thing you're going to see is something like this. It'll kind of change from year to year. But you'll notice that there are two options. So you can make your own plan from scratch, or you can use one of these plans that they have below that kind of get you started. So you, you don't have to use just what they suggest for that plan, but they are, are all based on a theme. So perhaps you want to focus on outdoor learning or numeracy and literacy with your eco team or your school. And so they choose the best actions that fit that kind of theme. But again, it's super flexible. You don't have to, you can add or remove any actions at any time. So for instance, I'm going to choose the getting started uh, package, which comes with eight actions and a point total of 60, but we can add to that. And when you click on that plan, you, you move to the plan part of the screen. Since we've just started, we have zero points. So our little plan progress bar, the green bar has not progressed. But as you start to answer questions and earn points throughout the year, you'll see that little green bar grow and eventually you'll hit these milestones of bronze, silver, gold, or platinum. And if you, for whatever reason, don't make it even as far as bronze, you'll always certify as a participant with whatever score you've got. And over on the right hand side here, we get to see those details that with the plan that we've chosen or the actions that we've chosen, we're eligible for gold if we get uh, at least enough points, at least 75 points. And our current level, of course, is participant. And as you add more actions, you have more available points and you can get up to platinum and beyond. So if we scroll down from our little graphics there, we get to see what actions we have in our plan. It also lets you know if you've started them or not. So of course, being the first part of the year, we probably don't have anything started. If I mouse over any of these action cards, that will pop up the little delete button at the corner. So if you decide at any point that you don't want that action in your plan this year, you can remove it, no problem. And there are a couple of actions that are locked. So the two at the top there, every school has, 
has to do, pardon me, every year, and uh, you can't remove those. So we have been working in the Our Plan part, but we're going to now move to the library where we can add other actions that uh, you might want to do. When you get to the library, it can be a little bit overwhelming because there's over 50 actions now. They have some search functions up here, which I really suggest you use and get used to. My favorite actually is sorting not by points, but by name. So if you click the by name choice and then click search, it does them in alphabetical order. And I just find that's a lot easier to find things than by points. We have this other option here to show actions that are already in your plan. Probably you don't want to see that because you just want to add ones that you don't have. But we do have these plus buttons on all these other actions in the library. And if you want to add that particular action, click the plus button and it's now part of your plan. So pretty easy to add and remove actions depending on uh, how you feel throughout the year. If you have a great eco team and you're working really fast and let's say you've got three months left and you've done everything. I mean, what a great uh, situation that would be. You can come back to the library and add more stuff. Why not? And I always like to point out this action to create your own, because you may be doing something at your school that's completely unique, but you feel like, why can't I get points for this? Well, you can. So by adding this action, and there's three of them, so you can add three, create your own. You can just describe what you're doing and who's involved. And those, those questions are pretty much the same for all the actions. And, uh, and you can get some points for that. Now, we will be providing links to these, but... EcoSchools Canada does have a PDF document that lists all of the actions that are possible and a little description about them. So you can look through this with your eco team to make decisions about what you want to tackle throughout the year. And they have another document called the Sustainability Review, which I think is actually really neat because what it does is asks questions and depending on what you answer, you can get an idea of maybe what you should tackle. So for instance, uh, if we take a look at this third one here, do students regularly visit one specific spot in nature to increase env environmental awareness and well-being? If you happen to check yes for that, you can see that it's the sit spot action for 10 points. So that's easy points. If it's something that your school is already doing, add it to your plan. Now, if you take a look up at the top, they do have some tips about whether you check something yes, somewhat, or no. And the idea is that you can now see when you answer all these questions, maybe some actions that your school is not doing. So the no section. And they do suggest that you should select a few of these per year so that you start doing new things in your school that you weren't doing before. And even the somewhat, those are things that perhaps you have started before or maybe they're on pause, especially during all this COVID business, you probably want to add some of your somewhats because you've got a little bit of headway there. And uh, those might be some easy points as well. But certainly add some of the yes ones because you know that's kind of guaranteed points for you. Um, and, and this year, because it's a restart year and we are talking about starting slow and, and building trust and capacity, that uh, you you could focus on the yes things this year just to get that momentum going. And perhaps if they're easy to do, you can come back with your eco team and select some of the no questions that you answered and, uh, and give yourself a bit more of a challenge. But uh, perhaps this is the document to start with this year with your eco team. It is a fillable PDF, Soraya, so you can load it up onto a, an iPad if you've got them. And, uh, and then just check them off. Uh, you could, of course, print it out if, uh, if you feel that would be helpful or on a Chromebook that you can carry around. Uh, you can do it that way. So kind of however you want to, uh, to work. On our website, we do have the EcoSchools Canada application page and the Getting Started page that has all of these links and, uh, and more. So we, we link to a number of videos that... EcoSchools Canada has made about how to register, how to add people. Whoop, how did that happen? And uh, so again, we will, when we share these slides, you see this uh, 
you know, click to load page button. We've got those on all of our resource pages. So if you want to load in that resource, you just have to click that button and, uh, and there you go. So that's, uh, that's my really fast how to register spiel. And I'm certainly happy to answer any questions right now because I suspect, am I ahead of time? Maybe a little bit. Yeah, I think you're you're five minutes ahead of time, so five that's minutes. great. So four I know. look at that, four minutes, maybe. Um, we're doing well. So if you have questions, um, yes, how to access the checklist? Okay, so that's going to be, and you know what? Maybe I'll um, stop this share. Where is it? So here's our web page and we've got all of these things down here. So the sustainability review PDF, that's the document I was just showing. And uh, so you can click on that. And of course we get this external link business, but uh, we can load it up here and you can actually do it in the browser. So this will work on your Chromebooks, uh, however you wanna answer your questions. Um, there's three pages of that make it through all of the different actions because they, they keep adding new ones. Um, as well as the actions, they do group it by SDG. So over on the left-hand side here, you can see which SDG those actions are related to. Um, and so you, on the last page, you can write down which actions you, uh, you'd like to do for the year and it'll be adding up the points that you get. SDG is from the UN. Those are the Sustainability Development Goals. I believe we've got a link to that uh, somewhere or another. But uh, to be honest, the UN site. No, this is this is on our website. Um, Eco Schools Canada also will have links to those. We just uh, find it's nice to have uh, a one-stop shop here. Um, if you click on the Getting Started button here. Uh, we go through with a little bit more detail the steps that you want to take each each fall. And we are linking to the EcoSchools app. Uh, there's videos on how to add people to your team. We'll be covering that at the end of today as well. Uh, how to make a plan. We've got our own timeline planner that you might want to either print or order from us, and we'll send it through board mail. We've got all the different environmental, big environmental things that are happening throughout the year to help you plan activities or events at your school. And uh, and of course, the main part here is how are you and your eco team going to divide up the actions throughout the year? Because you don't want to leave it all until May or April. Uh, that just adds extra stress. So try and chip away at things throughout the year. I know we tell this to our students all the time about their assignments. So and let's Chris, do it ourselves. I know, I know. And Chris, there's a couple questions about the registration. So, for okay. example, um, if you are registered, how do you include additional staff who are working with you? And part of that also question is, do all four leaders have to register? So what's the benefit of registering all of the team members, uh, sorry, adult team members and uh, benefits of not? Okay, so definitely, uh, I would suggest that anybody who's working with you on the eco team should register because they can sign in and help you answer questions. Um, so I think I've, I'm hitting my time here. Um, at the end of today, I will walk through how you uh, are answering the action, the Eagle School action questions, uh, which gets you your points. And the more people you've got helping you out, I think the better, rather than having just one person uh, take the responsibility of filling everything in, because that can be a lot of work, especially, again, if you're kind of leaving it to the last moment. Um, I can pop the link to the planner in the chat, no problem. Again, Actually, I think Michael uh, it's, it's on our website. Oh, oh, sorry, Michael's yeah. already done that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank and you, Michael. Here's, here's the page, uh, Samantha. When you're on the uh, main Eagle School site, the actual chalkboard-looking image getting started, you actually click that, 
And then that brings you to this page where you'll see the timeline planner. Yes. Yeah. We've got it uh, in a bunch of places. And if you don't want to print it off yourself, we can uh, print it on our color printer and send it to you through board mail. Yes. So the eco schools, the ECA does save everything that you did last year and you can load that in and, and check that out. So for instance, if I do this really quickly, so you can take a look at different years. So if you go back to last year and actually maybe I should, uh, this might be, you might have to go under administration and plans and then choose the year here. And then I'm looking at all the schools just because of my access, but you would just see your school and you could take a look at the plan, what you had from last year um and everything that you uh you did there so you can certainly go back and refer to uh what you've done before in past years and just to reiterate uh mirrors asking um do we can she you know share her password and other people go under her or would it be best for each of those members to uh create their own registration link uh, I would say you can certainly reuse a sign in with other people. Um, who's going to know? Uh, I don't think there's any issues with even if you sign in the same time. I, I don't know if I've really tested that, but I, I don't think they prevent you from having two people log in with the same profile. Um, but it's pretty easy to to add. If you go to the user section, there's a little plus button up at the top. Of course, I see everybody but you would just see the people in your school. So it's probably going to be you or maybe one other person, um, but you can add uh, another staff member. You can add a volunteer or a student. And again, it's relatively easy to do. It doesn't, doesn't take much. And Soraya's question, are you expected to add more each year to retain platinum? No, that's not an expectation. Um, if you go back to this, this is it. You need to get 101 points. So um, whether you do the same actions you did the year before, you do obviously want to maintain uh, the actions that you have been doing, but you don't always have to do the same ones from year to year. You can add some from that, you know, no column if you, if you do the uh, sustainability review um, to add, you know, more challenge to, uh, to your eco team if that's necessary. Uh, but, uh, but no, you don't have to keep getting more and more points. There's just that 101 threshold. If all leaders register, can we work under one plan under one leader? Uh, yeah, that is correct. So Mary, when you log in, you're, it's kind of like everybody's logging into the school. Exactly. So, so you're, it's got multiple users, but for the one plan. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. And so again, my, my account is a little bit weird because I get to see everybody, but you would only see the people in your school and they only see your plan. Okay. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint because now I think we're ready for Jen. Yes. Hello. So, oh, thanks, Chris. Okay. So Chris, you're going to run my slides for me. So I'm going to talk today about uh, taking climate action through food waste. And, you know, what, what do we mean when we say food waste? So food waste includes all the food intended for human consumption that never reaches us and edible food that consumers throw away. And, you know, the problem with this is that it's not just about with wasting food, and it's a, which is a social or humanitarian concern, but it's also an environmental one. And I've got a little video to uh, play next to that slide. And... Um, this will really speak to the, the problem in Canada. We all love food, but even so we waste 450,000 eggs a day in Canada. But that's not all. We also dump 1 million cups of milk down the drain and throw out 2,400,000 potatoes every single day. The naked truth? Canadians waste way too much food. Food waste from our homes is having a major impact on our environment. But unlike many of the problems facing us today, this one is easy to solve. Love Food, Hate Waste Canada is a movement that utilizes technology, education, and community to tackle this important issue. 
A growing body of evidence tells us just how big the problem is. In 2017, the National Zero Waste Council's research showed that over 60% of food waste is avoidable. Things like stale bread, spoiled fruit, expired dairy, wilted lettuce, it all adds up. Fact is, we buy too much food. It goes bad before we can even eat it. Ew, gross. Love Food Hate Waste Canada is here to help and partnering with great organizations from coast to coast to coast. Teaching easy food tips like how to store your food so it lasts longer. And we have tasty options for people to better plan their family's meals. More importantly, we need you. Your ideas, your friends, your energy. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at LFHW underscore CA and on Facebook at Love Food Hate Waste. And go to lovefoodhatewaste.ca to learn more. Together at Love Food Hate Waste Canada, we can create a tastier, fresher, and more sustainable future. Why do we care that, you know, food waste is a problem? It's, you know, obviously there's the, the climate change, it's a climate change issue, it's a social justice issue, and it's an economic issue. Well, and why is it a problem? You know, putting avoidable food waste in the green bin creates the need for additional resources and increased cost. Putting food in green bin means that it goes to landfill where it decomposes and produces uh, greenhouse gases like methane, which Pam mentioned in her presentation about how that, that is really a big problem. But wasted food also squanders the resources that we need to grow it, produce it, distribute it, and to consumers and all along the chain that is producing greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to climate change. And in looking at the financial impact of food waste to us as Canadians, um, they mentioned in that video, 2.3 million tons of edible food is wasted each year, which costs Canadians over $21 billion. And in putting this together and doing the research, I, I just found that staggering. And when you break this down by household, you know, it's, a, it's 140 kilograms of wasted food per year at a cost of about $1,300. Um, and 63% of the food that we throw away could have been eaten. So it's quite, when, you know, when you, you hear that and you see that, you think it, it is a huge problem. And what are we wasting in our Canadian households? There's vegetables and fruit there, which counts for about 45%. 13% are leftovers, then we have bakery, bakery goods, and um, dairy, eggs, meat, and then other things like snacks. And then in terms of food, how does food waste impact climate change? Well, next slide, the 2.3 million tons of avoidable household food we waste that we just referred to is actually emitting 6.9 million tons of CO2, or it's the equivalent to putting 2 million more cars on the road. And, you know, when you think of that, it's like, we all know how bad Toronto traffic is. You know, this is that, that slide there is actually um, in Toronto, you know, it's gridlock all the time, but to think that our food would be, the food we're wasting is equivalent to 2 million more cars. It's just it's staggering. And globally, food loss and waste account for 10% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. Sorry, there's something missing there. Um, so this, uh, image here, you see the, the, this is from Transform TO, which is the City of Toronto's Climate Action Plan, and they've identified in that plan sort of the three heavy hitters for uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And you'll see that waste is only 7%, which, you know, seems like it's not so bad, and that's actually come down from, in 2018, it was at 9%, so there's already been improvement. The 7% waste, what that really is referring to is the food waste that is going to it, it landfill and creating that methane gas that Pam was talking about. So um, it's it's very specific to um, what they're trying to target in terms of, of reducing waste. So food waste is, is a big one. And that video we showed is um, the city, uh, city of Toronto is using uh, that information and, and um, awareness campaign. Uh, for for our citizens, you know, how is food waste a social justice issue? Um, you know, the UN says that food loss and waste threaten global food security and it impacts people experiencing health, health, socioeconomic, and environmental disparities. So, as Pam mentioned, 
you know, the people that are being most impacted by the climate crisis are the people that have really have the least impact in creating the climate crisis. So, you know, in terms of food waste, we can, you know, very easily see the connection here. The, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it is it states that the right to food is a fundamental human right and everyone has the right to be free from hunger. And it's estimated that 3.1 billion people worldwide do not have access to a healthy diet and about 828 million people go hungry. You know, it's there. there is a huge impact to people's daily lives. And the, <clears throat> excuse me, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres says that food loss and waste is an ethical outrage given that so many people go hungry. So all of this means you know, there's an urgent need to accelerate action to reduce food loss and waste. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste. It, it, was, it first began in 2020. So this took place on, on September 29th, so just a couple of weeks ago. And this would have been the third um, day that they... Uh, held and its objective is to make clear that there's a call to action for public and private entities from across the food system and consumers to work together to cut food loss and waste and to enhance the efficient use of natural resources, mitigate climate change and support food security and nutrition. So the fact that, you know, there is a day, it really says that, you know, this is something that, you know, the world needs to address. And as Chris just mentioned, the uh, SDGs, so the Sustainable, Sustainable Development Goals, which are connected to uh, the Equal Schools work that you're doing, Goal 12 in particular, is to ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns, specifically Target 12.3. By 2030, we are to half per capita global food waste at the retail and consumer levels and reduce food losses along production and supply chains, including post-harvest losses. So you'll see in the uh, infographic here, it's not just at the consumer or household level of grocery stores. It starts right from harvesting, transportation, the storage of it, the processing of it. So all in all, you know, you have 13.3% is being lost after harvesting and even before it gets to the retail markets, and 17% of total food is wasted at the consumer level. And so now coming back to Canada, we were talking about the global level. Now this is food insecurity in Canada. You know, we see that 12.4% of uh, households in, in Canada are food insecure. And in particular, when we sort of drill down and we look at, you know, the racial disparity, that look at the Black households, it's 28.4%. So, you know, again, this is a crisis on, on so many different levels. It's not just about the climate crisis. <clears throat> now going into more, you know, close to home, going to Toronto, <clears throat> this is information from public health. And when we say food insecurity, you know, we, we are really referring to the inadequate or insecure access to food due to lack of money. And often, you know, our, there are households that have to make decisions about are we paying our rent or are we Paying, paying our bill, our electricity bills, are we buying food? It's it's that bad, and it's you know one in five households in Toronto suffers this, which is you know that's a huge amount. And we saw this during COVID when our schools were closed down. You know we have many students that come to school for food programs, and this is what our Toronto Foundation for Student Success aims to do. They're really, um, you know, trying to address the, the fact that there are children that are coming to school hungry every day. We have one in four children in Toronto living in poverty. Um, and in our high risk communities, it could be as much as 60%. And, um, you know, the fact that our the student nutrition programs are, are serving 218,000 meals every day to our students. You know, it's when we really understand what those numbers mean, it, it really, you know, how can we be on the one hand wasting all this food? And on the other hand, we have, you know, students and their families who are, who are hungry, they're suffering poor nutrition, it affects then our students and their education. So <clears throat> it's food waste is, is really a big, much bigger issue than just a climate change issue. So if we can reduce 
uh, the lost or wasted food, it means that we will have, you know, more food for everyone, less greenhouse gas emissions, less pressure on our environment, increased productivity and economic growth, um, you know, reducing food loss and waste. It, it presents opportunities for immediate climate benefits while improving the overall sustainability of our food systems. And, you know, it really is a necessary transformation to ensure better planetary and nutritional outcomes for current and future generations. Yeah, and I, I acknowledge that with these food and nutrition programs does come a lot of waste. And this is, you know, we've already been hearing from some schools about that. And we, we also recognize that in the last couple of years with uh, different public health re requirements for the green bin, that in a lot of our schools, you know, the green bin programs have, have sort of come apart. So we're really looking at this year as a, as a relaunch. And as we always say, you know, start small and do it well. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of things that are, are, you know, trying to be restarted this year, I think. And we, we just want to, you know, be kind to each other and, and just, you know, go slowly. We'll get there. Yeah. And just to add to that, Jen, last year, Chris and I started working with the central staff in charge of delivering the nutrition services across the board. And so, again, because of COVID, we were uh, tackling some of the public health sink requirements, as well as the individual packaging. And so some of that um, will be, uh, be changing. So we'll continue to update you. Um, and again, kind of go back to last year's uh, mantra, which is do what you can. Um, we're not asking you to change things at the system level. That's our job. Um, but, you know, together with your students, perhaps you can find local solutions for some of the some of the issues as the regulations change. So, you know, now that we've talked about the issue of food waste, how much food we're wasting, um, you know, that is that it is a social justice issue and a humanitarian issue, you know, now what? Like, we, you know, we, we need to change our mindsets and change our habits. And we have to understand our, our inter interconnection to food. And schools are a great place to do this. So if we look to our, you know, Indigenous communities, um, you know, they look at food much differently. They're, you know, they're, we are all on this land and we are part of this treaty. And food is central to our survival. Um, and that, you know, we as humans, animals, plants, land, water, and spirit are interdependent in, and in relationship to each other. So anything that's produced by the land, such as our food, you know, we should be careful about it and we should uh, steward it and respect it because we need it. So it's that, that colonial mindset again of, you know, we, are, we think we are separate from, but we are really, you know, part of this whole food cycle. And, you know, if we look at the dish with one spoon uh, wampum agreement, you know, it's the dish represents that the land is to be shared peacefully and the spoon represents the individuals living on and using the resources of the land in a spirit of mutual cooperation. And there is an expectation that, you know, as settlers, like we are, we are invited into this treaty in the spirit of, you know, peace, friendship and, re and respect. You know, we look at those three points, take only what you need. You know, we are not doing that when it comes to food. Leave some for everybody else. You know, that speaks to the inequity of, you know, the food in the world. You know, we, we have hundreds of millions of people who are going hungry. And, and then the point of keep it clean. So in doing this research, I came across this uh, lovely woman who her name is Atlanta Grant. And she is, um, she's been doing research on, instead of food waste, food cycling, which is what Indigenous people, you know, sort of refer to their scraps. She's worked at Toronto Public Health. So it's great because she's, um, you know, the research she's doing is based in our city. And, you know, she's looking at traditional food systems, uh, knowledge preservation, and food cycling. She's looking at the indigenous food waste practices and, you know, with the hope of reclaiming autonomy and food sovereignty within indigenous communities. And she's, you know, trying to address the need for a restructuring of individual waste practices within our, our urban environments. She's also looking at um, 
Uh, so with food cycling, she's looking at the distribution of food from harvest to scraps as viewed through Indigenous peoples. And it, you know, holds critical knowledge and practices used for such a long time that you know she she sees this as a way to help combat our broken relationship with the land and future utilization of food pathways. Um, you know, and there are ultimately some foods. So, what the way the city refers to it, there's avoidable food and unavoidable food. So, unavoidable food is what needs to go into the green bin. What's happening is a lot of avoidable food is going in, and that that is what's you know leading to this, these high rates of um, food waste. So the green bin program um, again, it was designed for unavoidable food waste, so scraps, peels, cores, uh, bones, uh, eggshells, but not for an apple that could still be eaten or a banana. And you know, I'm I'm sure that you have all seen this in your schools with the cafeterias or, or um, nutrition programs. And, you know, the benefits of the green bin, like why, why do we want to participate in this? So we're trying to keep food waste out of the landfill, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And in turn, that, that um, the organic material is turned into nutrient rich compost, which the city does use in the, for their, in the parks but they also um, will give it out to uh, households on our, our environment days. And the organic waste um, is processed using anaerobic digestion, which generates a byproduct called biogas. And that biogas is actually turned into renewable natural gas and it's injected into the city's natural gas grid. So really showing that, you know, it goes in what we're putting into the organic materials in our homes and our schools. Um, it's still, you know, that it still has a life after whether it's with the soil or, or um, the, this renewable natural gas. And in terms of um, food waste reduction in the city of Toronto, it is one of the, the things that they are really focused on. So i mentioned the 7%. Um, of the greenhouse gas emissions is created by waste. It's really the city is targeting um, food waste. Uh, and those of you I know over the years have participated in Waste Reduction Week and they actually have Food Waste Friday. Um, and I believe Waste Reduction Week starts on uh, the 17th of October. So very timely uh, for our discussion today. So in terms of uh, the green bin program to like, redo it at your school. Uh, it really is a whole team approach, right? We need all of us working together to, you know, to make it work. So, you know, speak to your principal first, if you're, you're you know, thinking about relaunching, or if you want to expand it again a little bit, um, you know, your principal can help provide the leadership for the process. Teachers and students help with the monitoring, empty and clean the room size bins. I know I've already heard from some caretakers who are wondering, um, you know, about whether their, their eco teams will be back, because uh, we know that, you know, caretakers who work with the, the students, uh, it's, it can be very uh, impactful and, and positive in, in the school itself. So the caretaker's responsibility, they, they empty and line the residential size green bins, and they transfer the organics from the residential size green bins to the green carts, or those large metal uh, bulk bins that are emptied by the city. And you know, if in, in conversation or in doing a, a sort of look around what the school has, I see that someone's already asked us in the chat about getting more green bins. Um, the facility team leaders who the caretakers report to can help with providing the outside collection containers or connect to the city for the coordination of the, of the um, collection. And what do we do? So we are here to help you with uh, rebates for getting the green bins. Um, we have posters, the waste sorting posters. Uh, we can offer direct support to launch the Green Bin program and, you know, help you set up routines and overcome any challenges. And we can connect you with our uh, educational partners that offer classroom waste programs, workshops and assemblies. And we can help your, your ah, excuse me, and we can help your eco teams connect to the Green Bin actions to the eco schools program. So again, start small and do it well. Um, in terms of the actual pickup, it um, it's 
weekly pickup and it's if you have garbage picked up twice a week you put it out on the first day and you know really focus on the successful collection process from one area so you can start with the paper towel collection in the washrooms or classrooms i know some classrooms are doing like kleenex and uh, and paper towel uh, you can place a residential size green bin in the lunchroom or cafeteria or collect food waste created from a particular program, whether that's the breakfast or snack program. And, you know, regardless of how you start, the expectation from the city is that we are putting our containers out for collection each week. Again, you know, so you can start with your daycare or food program. So in terms of setting up your program, you know, you've got to let everybody know. And um, again, this can be an ideal project for your eco team. And some of the steps to go through are, you know, setting up the green bin team, develop your promotional plan. So that's communication to the school. Could be, you know, the kids will be doing posters, um, skits. We've seen kids go class to class doing skits. We've seen assemblies. Uh, the students are doing um, morning announcements. Absolutely a boomerang lunch. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then launch your program and, you know, work through anything, anything that comes up. And, you know, don't think about expanding until you have uh, really, you feel confident that, you know, what you're doing is working. So in terms of the Eco Schools Canada action cards, um, there is, so obviously we conduct a waste audit. You know, we've been promoting that for years. It really helps to see what are the issues. So if you, you're doing a waste audit and you see all this uh, uneaten food like that, that could still be used. So I'm thinking bananas that, you know, have not been opened, but tossed in the green bin, could be apples. Um, you know, so doing the waste audit can help you identify if there are issues like that. Then there's uh, scrap your food waste. So this is um, getting your school ready to scrap avoidable food. So there's actually a campaign specific to that. And again, you can tie it into Waste Reduction Week. Waste-free lunches. Somebody mentioned um, boomerang lunches. Um, you know, if we're educating our students about the problem of food waste, you know, they are the best advocates to go home to their parents and talk to them about, you know, why we don't want to waste food. Um, and, you know, by extension, waste-free meetings and events, we've seen lots of our, our um, uh, schools when they're, you know, they're bringing lots of food that they're really trying to make sure that, you know, they're not overbuying, they're, you know, and, and really trying to help minimize the waste. So again, I'd mentioned Waste Reduction Week, so that's coming up next week, and Food Waste Friday will be uh, on the 23rd. And new this year, uh, food literacy is now included in the uh, grade one to eight Ontario science and technology curriculum. And um, uh, a, a group that really was working to promote this uh, food literacy, you know, are, are saying that it's uh, related to every grade that empowers students to make decisions that affect physical and mental health, consider local food production and the scientific processes involved in agriculture. And in the grade Three, I think it's phys ed and health, they actually do talk about um, uh, food waste. So there are, are opportunities for, you know, really using the curriculum as a, as a rich uh, teaching tool. I have included uh, all the, the strands and the areas and the grades. And here are some resources that we've pulled together um, that we used um, for the presentation. Uh, I just discovered this Too Good To Go app, which I thought found amazing. Um, so if there's, you go on the app and it will let you know, you tell it where, if you let it know where you are, it will tell you about restaurants. Oh, here, there's Kristen, somebody knows about it. I just discovered it and I think it's amazing. So instead of, throwing the food away, you know, it might be a little bit older, like if it's a grocery store, you can go on this. And then if there's a restaurant or something near you that has, you know, food, you can go and there's like a surprise bag, you can oh, and there's another one flash food app. So there, so there's a lot of good resources out there. And I think I, I'm, I'll end it there. And uh, if we have any questions, Pam, I'm not sure how we are for time. Yeah, we can take, because this will be a, a, a big topic in terms of green bin questions. Uh, one of the things we need, Jen, is, is there a site that we've got the information about the bin ordering in that? Did we, 
can we put that? Uh, do we have a link in the chat or is that site still under construction? That site is still under construction, but we can uh, include it in the resources. I think through my path, Chris, we can send an email out to everyone afterwards. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and, and then we will include it in there. Questions? Uh, these are ones we haven't answered yet. Um, just to let you know that uh, I wanted to address Robert's questions. We are required by the city to off, uh, to run the Greenbrand program if we are um, with GFL, which is Green for Life, and that's the city contract. But some schools, and I think it's a lot of the schools sort of in the city core, the old city of York, are under Miller Waste. And so you may not have uh, that option. And so I remember some of the platinum schools diverting organics through neighbors um, because the school itself did not pick up. Um, absolutely, critters and green bins. So anytime you get wet waste, your uh, wet waste is things like orange peels, banana peels, um, you know, things that are moist, uh, the fruit flies. Um, you can have plastic bags in the small ones and the caretakers obviously will put out the food, anything wet waste in the outside containers. I have to say uh, the Warren Park School uh, had wonderful raccoon family that uh, lived in the green bin, <laughs> the bulk green bin, and it became a nature note instead. <laughs> so <laughs> we can't avoid them. They do live with us. Um, in terms of compostable bags, please do not because they shred and then turn into microplastics and we can't get them out of the sorter. Uh, so uh, you can use plastic bags. Um, and in fact, the midsize one and the, um, the big one, uh, they do use the clear plastic bags. In the small one, you can use plastic bags so that you can reduce fruit flies. But we're even suggesting paper bags, especially for snack, put the stuff into the paper bag, send it back, and then goes into the, the mid one. And you can order paper bags for the stock um, you know, for snack programs. Oh, uh, sort the compostable bags break down and then in the sorter, they don't float to the top. And uh, Aaliyah? Yes, Jen. Hi, just Pam. Um, I have a question about what you said about GFL requires us to use uh, the green bin program. Does that obligate us to use? Like if I have a resistant chief caretaker, who says that all of the caretakers are saying they're not doing it, does that obligation with GFL obligate us to participate in the green bin, bin program? And is that, is that my argument right there? Well, and we don't want to put you against the caretakers. So what we would mm -hmm. do in that situation is, and in fact, what we're doing is we're working with facility services right from the top level and then the facility teams to roll this out this year with them as well. And so if you... Okay. If the uh, caretaker has not got that message yet from the facility team leader, um, let's say by November, um, I can't promise anything because, you know, uh, but let's say, let's say you then invite me or Jen or Chris into the meeting virtually or in person and we sit down with the caretaker and the principal and we work out a customized solution. Um, so that they feel part of the solution. We never want you saying, um, uh, yeah, you have to do this. And you are right. It, during COVID, the message was, um, we aren't doing it. So at John English, all the bins were put away. Okay, thank you. Does that help? Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, I work with a, in our joint labor uh, management team. We have um, a number of facility team people that are saying we're going to help you. So if we need uh, extra help, we've got them on board as well. OK, so I think um, just we want to honor some of our time commitment. Um, We'll still stay on after this part uh, and the wrap up so that you can continue asking those questions. But let's get us into breakout rooms again. And the second question, uh, Chris, is in what ways might you engage your students in social and climate just action? So you can talk about food waste, green bin, but you can also talk about uh, food insecurity 
or any other uh, ways that you think your students might, um, or actions that their students might want to take action on, or find out from others in the room. What do you think you're going to do this year? Uh, again, um, honoring the, your uh, expertise in the room. Uh, it's just great to share. So again, we'll do that for 10 minutes. So we'll give you till 10, 10. 11, 10. Oh, 11, 10. <laughs> So welcome back, everybody. Uh, Eva was just uh, asking me a question. Where do you actually find the sustainability review document in the ECA? And it's part of the getting started action. So you actually have to click on the getting started action card. And in the resources section, it's uh, it's under EcoSchools resources. They have a whole list of, I can even just switch here. Why don't I do that? So here we are in the, the getting started action. And under resources, we have the sustainability review pre-assessment and they have a French version as well. So a lot of their resources, they do have a French version and they are constantly translating uh, their, their content into French. Uh, so if it isn't French already, that, that's probably happening. Unless it's an external resource, then they, they, they won't translate that. But all their internal resources are bilingual. All right, so we're getting down to the nitty gritty here. We're just at the wrap up. Um, as you switch slides, and uh, and I know we're a little bit behind, uh, but Gabrielle, what's a boomerang lunch? The idea is that what comes in to the <laughs> school goes home. And that can be problematic for some communities because of those banana peels and yogurt tubes and things like that. So it's probably a decision that you want to make uh, collaboratively with principals and parent councils. Um, the other problem is that some of our homes don't have access to a green bin program, so some older apartments, so it might be um, good to actually have the green bin at schools, but at the same time, a boomerang lunch, especially when you're eating in classrooms and things like that, allows the food waste to go home and be sorted. Um, or the containers, etc. So it's so whatever you bring in goes home. Um, and reach out to us if you want more information, because sometimes I have the questions to ask your parent community before you set that up. Okay, over to you, Chris. All right. So we're just going to plug a few things that's uh, that are in the pipeline that you might be interested in. And uh, the first one is... Uh, uh, the OISE conference, and it is going to be a hybrid conference this year, so you can sign up to go in person to OISE, or uh, some of the things you can log in through Zoom, and uh, that is happening on November 19th, which is a Saturday, uh, and of course we've got a, our click to load page here, and that'll take you to the Brightspace uh, login where you can sign up for how you want to join this, and it is course free. So nothing wrong with that. We have some other of our more regular webinars coming up again with OISE and participation with OISE. And the 19th, we've got uh, land-based learning with First Story and Natural Curiosity. And that's with uh, John Johnson is going to uh, be uh, working with that. And it's, it's a local Toronto uh, angle as well. And uh, on the 22nd or the 25th, both of those are the same thing. Uh, that's an in-person event. And uh, the 22nd is a Saturday, so that's 2.30 to 4.30. And the 25th is a Tuesday, and that's 4.30 to 6.30. And Jill Carter and uh, Trina Moyen are going to lead a walk through the annex and uh, reigniting the relationship with buried water. So there's a lot of creeks in Toronto that have been put underground and uh, we've lost you know, those features. And uh, so they'll be talking about those and where you can see where they used to be. And I know in my East York area, we've got a street that has a big curve in it. And that was from an old creek that was running through there. That's now a road. So all kinds of interesting things you can find in Toronto. We, of course, do have our newsletters, both our own TDSB EcoSchools newsletter and the EcoSchools Canada newsletter. And uh, there is a link uh, or we have a newsletter web page on our site that you can sign up to 
both of those. And again, our little button here will help load that in. And you can sign up anytime if you haven't already. Uh, it's always good to talk about our new website. So if you haven't really been in EcoSchools for the last couple of years, we don't really have our own website as a standalone thing. We are now part of the Environment, Energy and Climate Action uh, website, which is really for the sustainability office. And so we do have a lot more pieces that we're involved with, uh, like that energy and climate action team that I mentioned at the beginning. And so you can find out all, about all the things that the sustainability office is trying to do in the TTSB. Some of it's banging heads against walls, but uh, we're slowly working our way through making some meaningful changes here in the board, which of course is ginormous and moves very slowly. Uh, we do like to point out our green teacher resources. So we do pay for a board-wide subscription to green teacher. We do have a page on our website that uh, has information on how to log in to get uh, any of their issues. So uh, they, they have a lot of things actually available. They have webinars, they've got podcasts that apparently uh, have been going very well. Uh, of course, uh, back issues that you can access. And every issue of Green Teacher has all kinds of activities and resources that are specifically for teachers uh, in the trenches and how you can, you know, pass this information on to your kids and do fun stuff in the outdoors. And this is an interesting research project that I'm going to get Pam to talk about. She has a bit more insight. Great. So we've been contacted by a woman named Josefina uh, Reuters, who has is working on her PhD at York. She has got the ethics reviews to work with both staff and students here at TDSB. And she, her main focus is climate drama. So if you are interested in putting drama or up, upping your drama program, um, she is an experienced educator as well. Um, and so she is looking to help you put drama with a climate change focus, really the theater of oppressed, uh, the theater of the oppressed um, sort of pedagogy and working through that. So if you are interested in working with uh, Josefina, take a picture of this slide. Uh, obviously, we'll send it as well, um, but you can contact her directly. It's a free opportunity, but there are some requirements in terms of attending a focus group, co-creating the lessons, implementing the lessons. But the best part is she's available to come to your classes to help put the, the um, drama lessons into play. So I thought that would be great because why not work with another educator? When do we get to do that? All right, moving on. We This slide has a bunch of stuff that we've talked about uh, with some direct links to our EcoSchools site within the sustainability site and our order form uh, to get posters and stickers and other resources that we get from the city as well. Uh, always good to visit the Waste Wizard to find out uh, what goes where. And, uh, and that is it. So thank you very much for coming and joining us this morning and uh, being serious about starting your EcoSchools program again. And we know it's been very difficult and hopefully this year is smooth sailing.